stand our feet, church. We don't just serve the next gen. The next gen is helping us lead this Come thing. Come on. And it's yeah. because of your leadership. So we honor you this morning and we're ready to receive the word, Thanks, my man. guy. Come on, have a Thanks, blast. OC. Come on, church. You guys can grab a seat, grab a seat, grab a seat. Um, man, I'm excited to be here uh, today. And so there is this question. I'm gonna jump right in. There is this question that I've heard a long time ago, and then I heard it again recently. And I want you just to pause and think about it for a second. What would you do if you knew that God was real? What if you knew, not just believed in faith, but knew that God was real? Would it change anything? Would your life look any different than it looks today? Now, here's the thing. You might be walking in here today and you're actually sitting here thinking, man, that's actually a question that I've been asking. It's why I showed up at church today because I'm not sure if God is even real at all. Somebody invited me to church. I, I grew up in the church, whatever it might be, but man, there's just so many things that have happened in my life that I'm wondering, is God even real? And then there's others of us in this room that have been like, man, I've been walking with Jesus. Man, I, man, I believe. I believe that God is real. But here's the thing. There is a difference between believing that God is real and knowing that God is real. Come on, come on. So what would you do if you knew that God was real? Now, I, I, I was, whew, okay. Ha, ha, ha. Where'd my Bible go? Okay. Cool, 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 cool. No down, no down, no down. There was a Bible on there. Okay, I'll, thanks bud. Thanks Casey, just chuck that up there. <laughs> Beautiful, we love to just throw the Bible around and love church. That was a nice toss by the way, Casey. You should have played baseball or something. All right, so here's the thing. If God is real, we're gonna start by saying this. He would be our creator. Somebody say creator. Right, he would be our creator, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them. He gave everything, everything life. Some of you might be sitting here today going, eh, see, I'm not even sure I believe in that. Okay, can I just give you a couple quick facts about how cool our God is? If God is real, these are true, right? The sun and the earth are approximately 93 million miles apart. 94 millions apart, 94 million miles apart, no life. 92 million miles apart, no life perfectly placed, 93 million miles away from the sun means that we have life. Hold up. The earth is also moving at about 67,000 miles per hour. That's how fast it's moving through our galaxy, which is approximately how fast I walk across the stage from side to side. Now, meanwhile, at the same time that it's moving 67,000 miles an hour, it has the gravitational pull that keeps it intact, keeps it right where it is. It's also spinning at 1,000 miles an hour. So to put that in perspective, it's doing this. 67, oh gosh. 67,000 miles an hour, this direction, 1,000 miles an hour this way, with the gravitational pull that keeps it from flying off into the rest of the galaxy, okay? Here's the funny thing. The earth is also at a tilt of 23 and a half degrees. So the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the planets, here, earth, here. Or as Fat Joe said, lean back, lean back. Lean, nope, oh, no, no, you guys don't know what song that is. Nope, go, 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 we love Jesus. And some of you are like, oh, why didn't you do the wobble? Right, here's the thing, 23 and a half. That's a very specific number. By the way, 24, Earth doesn't have life. 22, Earth doesn't have life. 23.4 or 23.5, perfect. Okay, did you also know that our atmosphere, we have a whole bunch of nitrogen in there and nitrogen has to uh, convert seven thousandths or 0.007% of itself to uh, helium for us to have uh, life on Earth. There's also 21% oxygen in our atmosphere, which is the exact amount that we need to survive. 21%, 0.007, 93 million, 
67,000, 1,023.5. Okay, y'all, can we just say the, the idea that this just all happened? No, no, no. Somebody say creator. Okay, but some of you might be like, cool, cool, cool. That's awesome, Ben. That's awesome that you did that. But what about me? Because, right, how many of y'all can see me right now? Hi. <laughs> right, you can see me? The reason that you can see me is because in your retinas, right, there are 110 million cones working with 7 million rods, working with over a million, um, I'm gonna get this wrong, optic fibers, Right, or nerve fibers, sorry, nerve fibers in order for you to see. Let me say that again. The visual cortex uses 110 million cones, 7 million rods, and 1 million nerve fibers to see. That's just in your eye. Also, your body makes 2 to 10 million red blood cells every second. You have about 110 million white blood cells stored in you. And the reason that you're you is because of this thing called DNA, which is the code that's written upon you. And by the way, if you were to stretch out just a little piece of DNA, it would be six feet. If you were to put it all together, it would be so much that your DNA would go from here to the sun and back 400 times. Somebody say, Creator. So here's the thing, God is real, and the world proves it. By the way, go geek out on science sometime. The more you look at science, the more you're like, wow, our God is awesome. So what if you knew that God was real? First of all, he's all powerful, because he's our creator. He gave us life, he gave us breath, he gave us gifts, he gives us everything that we, that we have, that we need, right? But he's more than that. He also wants to be in relationship and he wants to call us to follow him with every fiber of our being, every part of us. It's what we call discipleship. Somebody say discipleship. No, 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 hold up, hold up, don't check, don't check out. Some of you are like, oh, it's one of those sermons. Like he's gonna ask me to do a bunch of things. Here's the thing. I don't wanna ask you to do anything that Jesus didn't ask you to do and all Jesus asked you to do was follow him. Let me say that again. I don't wanna ask you to do more than Jesus would ask you to do, and all that Jesus asks, asks you to do is follow him. Okay, so the God of the universe, right, creator of all things, also wants to be in relationship with us. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, go ahead and open them up to Luke chapter 14. You're gonna go to verse 25. While you turn there, I wanna tell you something else cool about our God. Right before this in Luke 14, verses one through 24, which by the way, I really wanted to preach that too, but they told me that I could only preach one sermon today. <sighs> so, all right. So, but in that, there's the story of a great feast, right? Jesus is invited in. He has some words for the inviters. He has some words for the inviter. He tells a parable about a great feast. I highly encourage that you go and read it because why it's important is this. What Jesus is saying is, I'm after your heart. Today, I want every one of you to know Jesus is after your heart. Whether you're in this room or you're watching online, Jesus is after your heart. It's what he wants. He wants your heart. He wants you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what it looks like to follow him. But here's the thing. He doesn't just wanna be this all-powerful, almighty, all-omnipresent, omnipotent, everything God. What he wants to be is in relationship with us. Here's the funny thing. The reason that Jesus puts such an emphasis on meals is because the Bible from beginning to, beginning to end is all about eating together. Anybody like to eat together? I like to make this statement. We eat 21 meals in a week, supposedly. Some of us are like, Psh, you eat three meals a day. Matt Jackson eats like 17 a day. If you know Matt, you know that's true, right? But let's just say every one of us eats three meals a day, which on seven days, that means that we eat 21 meals a day or 21 meals a week. How many of those meals are you eating with somebody else? My challenge to you would be this. What if every single week you took three of the 21 meals and ate with somebody that you didn't necessarily know or somebody that wasn't necessarily part of your family? And what Jesus actually says is, what if you ate with people that you don't normally eat with? What if you ate with strangers? What if you ate with those people that were the outcast, those people that didn't believe the way that you believed, those people with another political affiliation? Oh, no, 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 too far. I'm just saying. 
It's amazing to me how both political parties right now are basing their entire campaign on hate and not on love. No, no offense. That's, that was probably too, oh, dang it. Don't talk political, Ben. Get back to the Bible. Let's go. Okay, but here's the thing. In the beginning, God actually had walked with his people, right? And he ate meals with them. And then one day, Adam and Eve decided to have a meal without God and sin entered into the world, right? And so then, fast forward a few years, Jesus actually, or, uh, God actually ends up having a meal called the Passover meal where his people actually get to commune with him and remember what he did when he spared their lives, covered their sins, and took them out of Exodus, right? Then Jesus, God, the son, the son of God, comes to earth, and what does he do most of the time? We see Jesus eating meals with all sorts of different people, people that are super religious, people who are not religious at all. What we end up seeing is Jesus eating meal after meal after meal, and this all comes up to this moment right before he goes to the cross where he eats this meal that he calls the Last Supper, which he says, this is my body, this is my blood, broken for you, poured out for you, do this in remembrance of me. It all culminates at this meal right here, and then Jesus dies on the cross, raised up from the grave, and guess what? When he comes back, one of the first things that he does with his disciples is he eats breakfast on a beach. And somebody say, that sounds awesome? Right, and then while he's here, before he ascends into heaven, he eats with people many more times. He ascends into heaven, and then, oh, by the way, Revelation 19 tells us that there's gonna be a feast. There's gonna be a meal, a fantastic feast, a magnificent meal, the meal of all meals that we eat in glory with God. I heard one clap, thank you. Hey, we're gonna eat this great meal in, Re in Revelation with God. <laughs> Bro, come on! Like, this is how cool our God is. The God that put everything into place wants to eat a meal with us. And so here we are. We have a God that is creator. We have a God that is king over everything, and yet he invites us in to eat with him. Creator, king. Somebody say king. Yeah. King Jesus in the house. All right, so then Jesus says this. Sometimes you just gotta stop and take a breath. A large crowd was following Jesus. Verse 25. He turned around and said to them, if you wanna be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else, your father and your mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. Okay, these are oftentimes hard words to hear. But you guys, they don't have to be. Here's what Jesus is really saying. John Calvin once said it this way, the, heart, the human heart is an idol factory, right? The human heart is an idol factory. The reality is, is that the thing that separates us from God is our sin is idols. And here's the thing, Tim Keller once said it this way, everyone has something that if they lose it, they won't even want to live life anymore. That is what you're worshiping. Let me say that again. Everyone has something that if they lose it, they won't even want to live life anymore. That is what you're worshiping. Here's the thing, oftentimes when we think about idols, we think that they're bad things, right? Ooh, the God of Baal and the, and the, the, the Ashtorah pool and all that kind of stuff in the Old Testament. There's zero chance, no way, no how that I could possibly have an idol. No way, no way, it's nothing that could consume me, nothing that could bother me, nothing that is made by man, that I'm on all the time, that I can't stop thinking about, that I study all the time. Oh. But it's so, it's so useful. Here's the thing, I'm not here to shame the phone because the phone is actually incredibly useful. But here's the thing, most of the time, idols are not bad things, they're good things that we turn into ultimate things. Is your spouse your idol? Are your kids your idol? Or even worse, is your kid growing up to be a professional athlete your idol? Because you wanna live vocationally, or you wanna live through them. Is money your idol? Is stuff your idol? By the way, money, not bad. But when we make it ultimate, it becomes an idol. Stuff, not bad, but when we, make it, when we make it the ultimate thing, it becomes an idol. Here's the thing, the only reason that we're separated from God is because of sin, and most of the time, sin comes from our idols because we worship something other than God. So I, here's the thing, I'm gonna pause, even though I know I don't have a ton of time, I wanna pause and I wanna take 30 seconds for you to ask the Lord, Lord, what's my idol?
you're still listening, and you still don't hear anything, ask God, God, what's the good thing that I've made an ultimate thing and that I'm worshiping instead of you? Don't discount or miss what it was that the Lord just told you. It's going to be easy for you to be like, no, 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 it wasn't that. That's just, my brain just went there. I just thought that. That can't possibly be it. But it is amazing when we slow down and quiet down enough to be able to hear from what, what the Lord has for us, it's amazing what he'll reveal to us. The reason that I think it's important that we do that is because of this. First of all, we need to know that God is real. We need to know that he is unbelievably, incredibly real. He is absolutely real. Not only that, we need to know that he is utterly, completely, and totally in charge of this world and that everything revolves around him and not me and anything else that I worship besides him is futile and pointless. I'll say it this way because I tried to write it down wisely. Being a disciple starts with knowing without a shadow of a doubt that God is absolutely real, realizing that the universe is truly, utterly, and completely about him and not about me, and then finding my greatest joy in celebrating that reality no matter the cost. Why is that important? Because in the next phrase, Jesus is gonna say, but you need to count the cost. Check it out, verse 28. But... Don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Somebody say, count the cost. See, to follow Jesus, the most important thing is we have to start with this understanding that God is real because if we don't believe that God is real, if we don't know that God is real, then when it comes time to count the cost, we're gonna be like, I'm gonna put my money and my time elsewhere. Even though our time, talent, and treasures were given to us by the creator, by the king, we're gonna put them elsewhere because we don't believe this. This is why we started with this question today. What would you do if you knew that God was real? Because when we know that God is real, it changes the way that we live. We count the cost. And when it comes to counting costs, I love what Jesus did here. He used the example of building and the example of war. Right? Think about it. Anybody in here ever built a house? Go ahead. You can raise your hand or keep it down. Whatever. It's fine. Like, here's the thing. If you've ever built a house or done a, a renovation in your house, it always costs exactly how much you thought it would when you start out. And it takes the exact amount of time and prices don't go up. That never happens, right? It's all perfect. No, right? There's always more, right? But when you start off, you have to have a basic idea. Can you imagine? I mean, in my backyard, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna build a, a guest house. I'm gonna go to Lowe's. I'm gonna buy some blocks and we'll just see where we go. <laughs> I'm out there digging a hole, which by the way, I hear is one of the most difficult things to do. You like, like, I'm, you like dig and dig. Okay, anyway, I'm out there digging a hole. I put a couple of blocks in there. Oh, I'm out of money. Everybody's gonna drive by my house and go, what is that idiot doing? He didn't count the cost. Or what about war, right? Every single war that we've ever entered into, right, in the history of mankind, you start the war, you end it exactly as you planned with victory, and it costs exactly as much as you started, right? I mean, think back to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. It took us over 10 years and trillions of dollars to fight that war. But here's the thing, when it comes to building and it comes to war, what happens is, is there's a cost involved, a big, huge, gigantic cost, and so we need to count the cost. Here's the thing, Jesus says there's a gigantic cost to following me. 
You have to die to your old self. You have to die to your flesh. You have to die to the things of the world. But here's the thing. What he has is so much better. Like oftentimes we read this text and we go, oh man, that sounds terrible. Man, I thought following, I thought Jesus gave a free gift and it was wonderful and good, but you're talking about denying myself. You're talking about carrying my cross. You're talking about all this bad stuff. No, no, no. All the bad stuff is what once was. All the good stuff is yet to come. Like don't miss this. If the God, the God, not if, the God who is real, who created everything, who gave you life, talents, abilities, everything, he gives you the breath in your lungs, he can do immeasurably more than you can ask, think, or imagine, or in your own power. So when he says you must deny yourself, he's like, man, listen, I understand the flesh bodies that you're in, the sinful bodies that you're in. I know that you have them. I don't want that for you. Parents in the room, ever had this conversation with your kids? Listen, I, <laughs> I know that that seems fun. I know that it seems like everyone is doing it. I know that that seems great, but I'm telling you, it's not gonna turn out well. I've been there, I've done that. Nobody's ever said the line, right? Uh, I've been a kid before and a parent, you've just been a kid, right? We don't say stuff like that. Right, parents, we know it. And so here's the thing. If we, as parents, with our, with our temporal knowledge here on earth, can understand that for our kids, how much more can our heavenly father, who created the heavens and the seas and everything, know what's best for us? And so really what we're saying when we deny ourselves is this. I don't know what's best, but God does. Now that flies in the face of pride. And we walk in pride, so it takes humility. But I will tell you this, it is very easy to follow a leader when you believe that they're doing what's best for you. It is very easy to follow a leader when you know that he laid, that he laid down his life for you. It's very easy to follow a leader that you know gave you everything that you have, every good gift that you have. And when the storms come, and everything falls away, you will find that peace, hope, joy, and love are far greater than anything else that you could have. He ends this way, verse 34. Salt is good for seasoning, but if it loses its flavor, how do you make it salty again? Flavorless salt is good neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown away. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Okay, so mm, I love to cook. Any, any chefs in the house? You could be a home chef. I mean, like, you don't have to actually be a chef. Like, anybody like to cook? I make the joke that, like, before, while Heather was alive, I watched a lot of ESPN. After Heather passed away, I started to watch a lot of Food Network. Because I had to learn how to cook. And then I realized that I actually love to cook. And you know what my favorite thing about the Food Network is? Oftentimes in any of those competitive shows, they come up and they're like, oh man, this meal was so good. The protein was good. This was good. But you know what it lacked? It lacked a little bit of salt. Because don't we know that salt just makes everything better? Woo-hoo! Salt and butter, baby. <laughs> Boy, we cook with a lot of salt and butter in the Norvig house, which is why our foods are tasty. But here's the thing, right? Salt makes everything better. Salt isn't good by itself. Anybody ever had, like there was this one time I went to a restaurant here, it's a scratch kitchen here in town, and I had these like buttery, salty uh, corn, and I went and I scooped it, and what I didn't realize was that at the center of it, there was like a block of salt in the midst of butter, and I put it in my mouth, and I took a bite, and the salt hit my tongue, and my tongue couldn't taste anything for a day. Because the reality is, is that salt by itself is not good, but what salt does is salt brings everything, makes everything better. And by the way, long before refrigeration and everything, salt was like a commodity. It was traded like gold. Like salt was the thing that would preserve things, it would purify things, it would make things better. But I don't know if you know this, but salt was actually a sign of communion and fellowship in the ancient Near Eastern world. 
In fact, there was a saying back there that was called betray the salt. Somebody say betray the salt. And so what betraying the salt meant was that you were betraying someone that you should be in devotion to or loyal to. And so really, when you spilled the salt, like Jim Carrey in Dumb and Dumber, right before he threw it over his shoulder and hit sea bass, right? Right? It, that's the reason that it was bad luck, was because when you spilled the salt, when you knocked over, you were betraying the salt of the one that you were eating with. Which, by the way, you wanna have some fun? Go look at Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper, Look at Judas, the salt is spilled. Judas is holding a bag of silver and he spills the salt. It was Leonardo da Vinci's way of saying that Judas was the betrayer. Go look at it, I'm telling you, it's crazy. Because to betray the salt means that that salt is no longer good, it's no longer useful, and this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying you are the salt of the earth. Did you guys know that the church is the hope of the world? That you, as the church, are the hope of the world. You are light, you are salt. You are called to go out and to purify this world. You're called to preserve the world. You're called to bring newness. You're called to bring out the goodness of everyone around us. This is what we're called to do. So Jesus says this, first of all, God is real. God wants to be in relationship with you. So first of all, he's, he's creator. Second of all, he's king. Third of all, he says, man, count the cost and follow me. And by the way, I'll take away the gap between us that's called sin. So that you can go and be the salt of the earth. So that you can go into this world. And here's the thing, many of us say that we know this, but we walk around with lives that betray the salt. There are so many of us that we are the salt and we know that we're the salt, but we live lives that, man, if we're honest, if you knew that God was real, your life would look drastically different. Guilty. On a regular basis, I wrestle with what Ben wants and what God is calling me into. And if I don't believe at the core of my being that God is real, I'll choose Ben every time. So we have this unbelievable opportunity to be salt. I'll say it this way. The mission of God, Michael Frost, uh, a guy from Australia, a pastor from Australia says it this way. The mission of God, I'm gonna say it his way. The mission of God is alerting the, no, I can't. The mission of God is alerting the whole world to the fact that our God reigns through Christ. The universal supreme reign of the king of all kings. And we do this through both demonstrating and announcing it. See, we have an opportunity to go and be the salt, to announce who our God is, that God is real, he is worth following, he wants to be in relationship with you. Here's the thing, if I'm being honest, church, the cost is not that great when you understand how great it is that's asking, great, how great he is who is asking. So will you count the cost? Will you be salt? Church, I'm convinced that if we lived lives like we knew that God was real, the world would be changed. If we followed what he calls us to do, if we just followed our savior, if we did like Paul who says, follow me as I follow Christ, if we walked with shirts on the front that said follower and leader on the back, with that mindset of I'm going to lead people, not in my own power, not in my own strength, but following Jesus, the one who created it all. What if, what if we live that way? I'm convinced that the world could be changed, that we could be the salt. So Father God, Lord, I pray right now that you would do a mighty work in this place. I pray that you would stir in hearts, that you would draw us closer to you, and that you would change our lives so that we could go and change lives one person at a time. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Now before we get to the altar call and before I say amen, I, I wanna pray a Franciscan blessing upon you. So I'm gonna ask you to do this, if you're willing. I'll say it this way, if you call in the name of Jesus, will you, uh, will you put your hands out in a posture of receiving? If you believe that God is real, will you put your hands out in the posture of receiving? 
If you know that God is real, will you put, the hand, put your hands out in the posture of receiving? This is a, a Franciscan blessing. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless every single one of you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people so that you may work for justice and freedom and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain and rejection and starvation and war so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and to turn their pain into joy. May God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you, yes, you, can make a difference in this world so that you can do for Christ what others claim cannot be done. May God bless you with a heart that breaks for the things that break his heart. May God bless you with a divine tenderness. May God give you an ear that hears his voice and may God increase the anointing upon your life for you have been filled with the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now at this time I'm gonna ask everybody to stand up. There may be some of you that man, you didn't put your hands out. Because today you're like, if I'm being honest, I, I'm, I haven't made that decision to follow Jesus. And here's the thing. I, like I said, when I talked about the meals in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, the seas and everything in them, right? And in the, in the beginning, it was a perfect earth or a perfect world where, where man and woman, Adam and Eve walked with God in the coolness of the garden, but sin entered the world. Adam and Eve chose to eat of the fruit that they weren't supposed to eat. And because of that, they now had the knowledge of good and of evil. And because of that, evil and sin entered into the world. And every single one of us has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin is death for every single one of us. And yet every single one of us sins, so every single one of us deserves death. So God took matters into his own hands. He left heaven, came to earth in the form of Jesus Christ, lived a perfect sinless life, a life that you and I couldn't live. And his life was marked by love. He would eat meals with people. He would teach people. He would do miracles. He would heal people. He would do the unthinkable and the power of the spirit flowed through him. And yet they hated him because they looked at him and they said, man, I don't like that he has that and I don't. Pride reared its ugly head and they hated him so much that they put him to death on a cross. One of the most painful ways to die in all of human history, Jesus hung on the cross and it might have been our sin that put him there. It might have been the nails that put him there, but it was his love that held him there because when he said it is finished and breathed his last, our sin came on him. His righteousness poured out onto us. Anyone that calls on his name, you see, he conquered sin on the cross, but the story wasn't over yet because he rose up from the grave on the third day. Sin on the cross, death in the grave, raised up so that we could walk anew with him. You see, he calls us to live a resurrected life, but first we have to die to our old self with him on the cross. And when we do, we're filled up with that because here's the thing. He said, I'm not gonna stay here because there's a helper who's better. He ascended into heaven. Holy Spirit poured out upon us from God with us on earth to God in us in the Holy Spirit. And what happens is, is it changes us so that we can walk as salt in the world. And here's the thing, you might be sitting here, that's not me. Man, I've done too much. I'm too sinful, I'm too broken. Here's the thing, today is the day that all you have to do is come down front right here, call in the name of Jesus. He'll save you, rescue you, redeem you, change you, transform you, move in powerful ways. Because for those who have been forgiven much, love much. So church, will you sing? And if that's you today, you wanna call in the name of Jesus for the first time, I invite you down here. I'll lead you in a prayer right now.